All right, hey, GovCon Giants family. I am so sorry I'm late today. Uh, let me tell you, I just finished a really uh, exciting conversation with a guest of mine on the show. I'm going to, let me tell you, let's pull up my man Caesar here. So I just finished having this conversation with Caesar Nader, um, and he is doing some wonderful stuff out there in the world. So terribly sorry for being late. Thank you, everyone who stayed around patiently and waited for me for 10 minutes. Uh, so let's talk about simplified acquisition today. In fact, I didn't even have a chance to get my camera ready. And the funny thing is, I told Maria, I'm like, I'm going to get off this call at 5.30 with Caesar. Uh, and I didn't make it. So, oh, Maria said talk louder. Hold on. Talk louder. Let me make sure my stuff. Okay, let's make sure all my stuff is working, all of my faculties, my functions. How is it now? Am I working now? Maria, Colin, Brian, all of my people, Black Dog Home. Is it working? Am I good? All right. How am I? Sound good? Good? Good day, Thomas. Can you guys hear me? Can folks hear me? Hello? Can you hear me out there? The same. Okay. Um, I wonder why on mine the mic is showing good. Hold on. Now? How about now? Yes, yes, sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, good stuff. All right, loud and clear. Justin Harris, one girl, one truck. All right. Marty. All right, so yeah, I um I just finished the conversation today with my man Caesar. Caesar actually uh was in the Marines 23 years, came out. Uh and started helping veterans uh, transition. He actually formed nine years ago, the Export Solutions, uh, became AA certified. And let me tell you, he is kicking butt. I, I just show you guys, when I say kicking butt, like this is what I found him on Gov Tribe, so you know, okay, his rise, okay? So he went, I mean, you know, the last couple of years, he's been around 17, 16, 17 million, 25 million. So yeah, he's, He's doing some remarkable things out there. Uh, but we just like had, he, he called it an actual a love fest where we just were like uh, going back and forth and so much enjoying the content. He is a prominent speaker at the, uh, at everywhere. He speaks at Hub Zone National Council. He speaks at the um, 8A, National 8A group. He speaks at VIP, VIB. He is... Uh, the speaker's speaker right now all over. So he's just been doing some incredible stuff. And we really, it's funny because, uh, by the way, Maria, he he did say that um, he, he told us why he couldn't make it last year when we requested him to be on the podcast. He had a family illness that he shared. But uh, yeah, he, uh, he loved all the content and everything that we gave. And he said that the only thing is that Eric, he said, now how do you get the camels to drink the water? So we, you know, we have, look, we have a lot of content on here um, that we've published so far. Uh, we've answered mostly all of everyone's questions. So uh, at this point, it's up to you to really take the information and to do something with it. Uh, and that was really, you know, kind of the point of him and I, what we were talking about today and going back and forth. Uh, but yeah, it was a great uh, it was a great conversation, great story that we had, and uh, so that's why we kind of carry over a little bit past the hour. So, uh, Black Dog Home Builders, hey, new here, love what you're doing, just starting out in the space, very excited, great stuff. Uh, I'm glad you're here. Thank you for joining. Thank you for coming on. Uh, Justin Harris, did you see that we already had that video on Knowledge Base? Aloha from Hawaii. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, Brian says I'm echoing, uh, but everyone else says I'm loud and clear, so that's good. 
Okay, maybe your volume is low is what Thomas is saying. I'm loud and clear. So, hey, welcome, welcome, welcome. Today, actually, what are we talking about? We're talking about, what, simplified acquisition? Is that what we're talking about? Yeah? Okay. Um, I have to go back and look. I I just jumped on. I think today we're talking about simplified acquisition. And by the way, uh, I just want to kind of say this to everyone out here. If this is your time, uh, don't. You know, this I do this for you. I really do want everyone out here to succeed. So if you have any questions, uh, definitely, you know, ask away the questions because th this is my uh, Q&A session. And um, I, I really, it's, it's not just to teach, um, you know, because again, we have a course, we've got free courses, we've got paid courses, but really this is for people who are have questions and, and you don't get access to me because you're not probably one of my programs. So, you know, I just decided to uh, focus these Monday lives around a particular a subject or a topic only to, to give some sort of like context to the conversation. Um, but don't think I'm so rigid to where we can't uh, veer off into something that's interesting or something that makes sense for folks out there. Uh, just kind of want to let people know that. So if there's anything that you're going, you're struggling with, dealing with, any issues that we maybe we have not addressed in a video before in some session, let me know. Uh, definitely happy to address that here. Uh, helpfully go through uh, any questions that you may have. So just want to kind of put that out there for everyone because it seems like it's a one-way call and this isn't really supposed to be a webinar. Like this is supposed to be me answering people's questions and um, giving access to those folks who, you know, maybe they can't afford the program right now. So, and I'm okay with that. Uh, like I said, uh, we've got, you know, things for people at all levels. Um, and I see my man Brian Rodriguez has joined. Um, and so it's funny. Hey, Malik Gallen just says, and this is really good. I've been in contact with Crowley representative. Contact me if you want to know the requirements. Uh, Malik, that's awesome. I, I would definitely, if you know, I want to know the requirements so we can share it with people out there. Uh, in fact, Malik, um, we are actually looking at starting, and I think we may just go ahead and do this, um, a, uh, a, a Facebook group just for freight logistics transportation. So then that way you can actually post the requirements inside of there and let folks know how to monetize that. And, and, and be able to capitalize on that opportunity. So that's great. Um, and, and this is what it's about, really. Uh, that's what it's all about, is sharing information, uh, sharing insight for folks out there so that they can too. Uh, maybe you can actually pursue that opportunity, but others can. I know my man Brian is working on some big stuff. I got your email, Brian. Um, I know that a lot of people may not have known this, uh, but yes, it was my birthday last week so uh, I did not respond to emails since from Thursday forward so uh, I did see your email Brian uh, very happy for what you're working on we definitely want to be there so, to support you but no uh, I did not respond to any of the emails I was trying to actually get a break from some of this stuff um, as you know we go hard like like you know we came back last night and I had three podcast guests today alone. So, like, we are, I mean, probably today I've already put in um, eight hours on calls just for golf time. So, uh, let's talk about demystifying, demystifying simplified acquisition procedures, SAP contracts. Uh, again, like I said, if you have any questions, definitely put your question in the box and we will try to answer it. So, uh, simplified acquisition procedures, SAP. What's interesting, and I'm going to talk while I find this presentation because I'm so not prepared today. Uh, what's interesting, by the way, real quick, just kind of as a side note, uh, Bra uh, Caesar is in cybersecurity space. So, Caesar's company, uh, they do, da -da 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 -da, hold on, pull it up. Let me pull up Caesar stuff real quick, and then I'll we'll get back on track. So Caesar's company, uh, they do cybersecurity intelligence, counterintelligence, 
Uh, they place FTEs with the government. So he said to me, whenever he speaks at events, he gives out his card. Out of 100 people, only one person um, actually responds to him. So definitely, if you're in that space, reach out to Caesar. He just built a new facility, a cybersecurity facility, actually near Quantico, Justin, by the way, uh, to do what we talked about with your aunt. Uh, on the first level, they're going to have a cyber academy where they're training people. On the second level, they're going to actually start demoing products and ideas inside of their facility. And by the way, just so you know, he built this facility out himself. It's his building, his company, they own it. And it was $10 million facility that he built out. So uh, yeah, he he literally uh, built out a $10 million facility uh, focused on helping bring new ideas and innovations, technology to the government space. So if you have something that you're working on, and we're gonna talk about this in the IT group particularly, but if you're on here today and you're working on something, reach out to Caesar. Tell him you heard about me through the podcast uh, and let him know what you've got going on. Because he says that just it's again one in one hundred uh, people reach out to him. The other thing, yeah, Quantico, Virginia, correct. The other thing that he said, which I thought was uh, uh, pretty fascinating, and this goes back to uh, those of you who've been following me uh, for some time. And um, and even those who have not followed me, if you did not already see the video that I did on Sources Saw RFIs, definitely should go take a look at that video. Um, it's still up, actually. What's an RFI? What's a Sources Saw notice? Go and take a look at that because uh, one of the things that he said, and this applies to all of my 8A contractors out there, uh, is that he received Brian. By the way, Brian, are you listening to this? I want to make sure Brian's listening. He said that on his RFIs when he was an 8A contractor that he actually received one out of every five RFIs that he responded to ended up in a sole source contract. Now, you can't say when it's going to happen for you, but I just thought that was really interesting that he was able to actually put a percentage um, a number to because he tracked this information to how effective uh, response to RFIs was for his particular business uh, during the 8A process. So uh, I thought that was an interesting fact is that one in five, uh, at least for him, of those RFI responses ended up in sole source contract awards. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, so much that I want to share it. And then we're gonna talk about this. So simplified acquisition contracts as we go. So again, we have on here, let me see if I have it on my channel. Okay, we talk about it. Some of the videos that we already have publicly available on simplified acquisition. For those of you who are new to the channel and new to the content. Uh, like Maria said, remember to hit the like button. There's 39 people watching and only 10 likes. Uh, make sure everyone hits the like button. Thank you, Melissa, for sending me a message. Happy birthday. Uh, I'm seeing everything under SAP under 150 is an SAP is this is new. Yeah, Brian um, SAP uh, and again, I don't remember the dollar threshold. I've made that in some other videos But yeah, everything that falls under uh, Whatever that new threshold is Brian It may be the 150 maybe 250 depending upon what Congress recently approved everything that falls under that dollar threshold becomes simplified acquisition SAP um, and so, you know, one of the things that people talk about is simplified acquisition procedures, simplified acquisition projects. Uh, and and we've, again, like I said, we're showing you here, but I want to just, let me pull this up so people can know. So here it is, Brian. They moved the threshold, actually. Let's see, simplified acquisition threshold. Uh, the 250 for GSA funded, the deviation allows, simplified acquisition mission threshold. So here's GSA actually bumped theirs up to 250. Brian. As a class deviation, they actually bumped theirs up to 250 for GSA. And then we could look about at other areas as well to see what the threshold is. But again, we could look that up. Um, some of them, Brian, it's in part 13. Uh, some of them, Depending upon if it's like IT and the technology, 
uh, it actually goes up to $7 million. And look at that, up to $13 million. So it's a wide range, but for the most part, for most of the stuff that we're talking about, it falls, yeah, it falls under that 250 150 range. Uh, but the the thing about it is, what's, what's important to note is that a lot of people ask me, uh, Eric, where do I go to find simplified acquisition projects? And really, that information, there is no public database for where you find simplified acquisition projects. So there's no public database that you can go to and actually search the open list of simplified acquisition um, or simplified acquisition threshold type projects. Uh, the best source that we can give you to look that up is FPDSMG. So in FPDSMG, we'll go over to it. Right, and I and they're supposed to be merging this with beta sam at some point, but an FPDS and G, and I actually have to go back and pull up my notes here. Uh, uh, um, give me a second. And I don't know why, why is my Evernote not working. There it is. Bum, bum, bum. Okay, so let me um, see if I can show you this on the screen. Okay. Mm. I know I'm so bootleg. Um, so FPS NG, this is actually a breakdown. When you're looking at the awards, uh, and this is basic. I literally I pulled this from like the the help desk file, but I have it in my Evernote as a cheat sheet. Uh, for people out there, but if you're in FPDS NG, when you look at the awards column, okay, you see what this says, right? Under the awards column, it says anything, it says purchase order is an offer by government to buy supplies or services, include construction, research, development, upon specified terms and conditions using simplified acquisition procedures. So when you're in FPDS NG, if you see something labeled as purchase order, uh, that shows that it was using simplified acquisition procedures. Uh, and if you notice, whenever you see uh, simplified acquisition, well, I've seen people advertise simple acquisition uh, projects or uh, program, but that's not what it stands for. It's simplified acquisition procedures, right? And this was literally taken from the FPDS hand, handbook. So here, when you're looking at it, and let me just look. I don't have any specific examples. So I'm literally just winging this live on the spot. Let's see if we see it on here anywhere, how they awarded this. And I'm gonna cheat myself. Nope, I don't see purchase order on here. All right, let's see if we see it on here on this particular one. Uh, contract, next code. Uh, this one was a hub zone setup side. Okay, so that doesn't count. All right. Let's go back. Bum, bum, bum. Okay, uh, but this is actually a good lesson and tutorial in FPDS NG for those who have not done it already or done it before. When you actually go back in and search, you will see on here a different options. And when you click on the view tab, you'll see for example, like the prod code they use, the next codes they use. Sometimes in here there'll be a description. Uh, it'll tell you how many offers. Oh, you guys can't see that on the screen. Okay, yeah, you can. You can see the number of offers received. Uh, this happened to be hub zone set aside. I don't know why I keep getting these hub zone set aside projects. Hold on. Why keep I've got how is that a coincidence? I've got two hub zone set asides on the screen. 
I don't want no more hub zones set aside. Let me get action obligation. These are too big. They're not going to be simplified acquisition. They're too big. Let me pull date sign. Six million. Not going to be simplified acquisition. Let's take a look at this one by the Renew Group. Fourteen thousand dollars. Let me see what falls in that category. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, two three six two two zero. Nope. IDC. Indefinite delivery contract. Okay, so nope. Negotiated proposal. Full and open competition. Not simplified acquisition. So we'll have to go back and look. But uh, the point is, this is where you go to find out the where the information comes from and where they are issuing them. Um, this is where you go to find out actually who has been issued simplified acquisition in the past. There are other search tools like GovTribe and GovWin that does it for you. But you can find an FPDS where to find those opportunities, how they were issued. Now, how do you get them? That's and Obviously, that's the conversation today is how do we actually get the opportunities? Because if you're looking at the data, that's past data. So it's already beyond that point. And what you want to know is how do you get to be that person, that guy or girl that wins those opportunities? Um, let's talk about, uh-oh, something set aside. Uh, oh, yeah, Brian, your hub zone, right? Brian's hub zone. So I think Brian actually likes those hub zone set aside opportunities. And 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 actually speaking to that point, Brian, it's funny that when people say, well, I don't see any set asides. I'm looking in beta SAM. I just pulled up two examples accidentally that were both hub zone set aside contracts, which was a crazy coincidence, um, totally haphazardly. So maybe my uh, error turned into a, actual a lesson for people. Uh, the, the problem is, is that by the time that you see this stuff, like I said, it's already been issued. So how do we get in front of it? How do we get to those opportunities? Um, and we talked about that in some of our upcoming conversations, just kind of haphazardly discussing what Maria's doing, what I'm doing. And I'll share uh, some stories with you uh, recently. And, and I always, it's funny because Maria says I'm really good at this, uh, drawing conclusions or drawing uh, inferences from experiences that I had to share it in on how people can, can best take advantage of this. Uh, one of the things that, we do, and we talked about it before, is uh, we look at the project engineers, we look at the park managers, the people who are actually boots on the ground people working at government facilities installations. Uh, and we those are the people that we engage with, we talk with about what are the problem areas that the government is having. Uh, what are some of the challenges that they're having? And, and they're the ones that are actually going to help shape the requirements. So one of the things that you may want to do, and we had a student today that sent an email, or it was maybe last week, uh, that said he reached out to a contracting officer, and I guess they said something ne negative to him. Um, contracting officers don't write the requirements, right? They're given the requirements from someone else, and these are the people that you should be engaging with and talking with to put your company and yourself in a position to have access to simplified acquisition. Why? Because these opportunities do not have to be posted publicly the same way that you see on beta.sam. Okay, so when we look at uh, beta.sam, the former FBO, uh, those opportunities for simplified acquisition, they're not publicly posted the majority of the time. That's correct. So the, the, the majority of the time, they're not publicly posted anywhere until after the fact. The So Eric, if they're not publicly posted, why did you show me FPDS? Well, one of the things that I always tell people is uh, in order to understand well, where you're headed, it's kind of good to know your past. And, and looking at past activities is a good indication of what's going to be happening in the future. And in, in looking at are there contracting people or offices or agencies that do more simplified acquisition than others? Um, I would then, at that point, determine, okay, these, even though this agency may not be giving out uh, as much contracts, period, right? So if we look at, uh, you know, the methodology of who gives out the most contracts in my max codes, and we only are focused on that, that list of targeting those people or persons, or agencies, um, they may not be the ones that give out the highest number of simplified acquisition um, contracts. So that's
that's a different customer to look at if you're only wanting to focus on SAP. And I'll, and I'll say that again because it may be confusing to people out there. Again, when we're do, building our target market list, and if your focus is on SAP, that might be a different target market list than the ones of the customers who are spending the most money on your PSC and or NAX code. And so what you want to do in that case, and, and what does the FPDS tell us is, okay, um, maybe at the landscape shows there's 50 people or 50 agencies that are buying my services. So out of 50 agencies, Eric, who do I pick to go after, right? And conventional wisdom and even what we talk about, because again, my, my initial onset thoughts were people want to go after prime opportunities or people want to actually build really long-term sustainable businesses like my guest today, Caesar, where Caesar's goal was only to be a prime and only to actually grow into a, you know, from a small to mid-sized to a large business. And so his focus was not on simplified acquisition. So for him, the methodology and the tactics were, okay, let's look at the big fish who's putting out lots of opportunities uh, in this space, which gives me a higher probability of winning, which we call P win rate. So the higher probability you have of winning is called P win rate. It's good to know government jargon so that that way you can, um, you know, articulate yourselves when you're speaking in front of these agencies, you're speaking in front of the SBA, you're speaking in front of the Ostaboos or whoever else works on the government. And when they hear you start using this, this vocabulary, then they say, okay, this is not a person we're going to send back down to review, you know, to Sam, get registered in Sam, uh, get registered, you know, give you a capability statement, all this kind of stuff. They're going to take you as a professional and respect you and start talking about w real ways in which you can start penetrating their particular agency. So now going back to what, what is the method, the, when you're looking at this whole array of you know, 50 different agencies, we can search and sort by who is actually awarding simplified acquisition. Uh, one illustration that comes to mind is with the Coast Guard. Let me see if I can pull them up. Uh, And I may not be able to, to pull this up so fast, and I don't want to like kind of stop the momentum. Um, but the Coast Guard, what they do, sorry, I, I kind of went through this fast. But on the Coast Guard website, let me see if they have it on here. Um, I don't see it, so I'll talk to it while I pull it up. The Coast Guard, the way the Coast Guard is broken down, the Coast Guard has uh, two separate sections of the Coast Guard that, that uh, ultimately help small businesses. And the way that the Coast Guard breaks it down is, I want to find it so I can show you guys an example, is the Coast Guard actually breaks down the differences between oh no, I think I found it. My computer's moving slow. I apologize. It must be on vacation as well. Okay. All right, now let me see if I can pull this up for you to show you. Okay, perfect. Pull this on the screen. All right, and this actually, this is a, um, so this is a target market list that I created uh, a while back when I was researching contracting opportunities up in Northeast um, for an 8-8 client that I was working with. And so 
So when you, when we pulled up, and we, this all by the way, all this data came out of FPDS. Uh, so when we were doing our target market list and we we're doing our research for the Coast Guard, uh, we pulled up and we looked at okay, uh, in Rhode Island there were no Coast Guard contracts. Connecticut, these were the three breakdowns: Hampshire, Mass. Uh, and when we looked at the Coast Guard, so the Coast Guard CEU, that was the Civil Engineering Unit, and that was the localized Coast Guard unit for the Northeast United States. Uh, and then we looked at uh, the Coast Guard, what they call FDC, Facility Design and Construction Center. That was PAM, which is Small Business Specialist for the Coast Guard. Um, and then we had Shore Construction Logistics Center out of the Atlantic region, Norfolk. Well, and then you had the Coast Guard Academy. But uh, uh, what happened was the when I was doing my research with the Coast Guard, and I and I basically pulled up all of the contracts and I said, okay, this is the the Coast Guard who's spinning in Connecticut and Massachusetts. There was none in Rhode Island and New Hampshire. Uh, when I looked at and I reached out to Jane, uh, Jane here was a small business specialist in our area, and Jane was the one issuing the local contracts that were the simplified acquisition. When I called and I spoke to Pam here, okay, Pam said that her contracts were in excess of five or $10 million. So FDCC was facility design and construction. She issued out large contract awards. And, and what I'm saying to you is that even within an agency, let's say, such as the Coast Guard, uh, there is no, when people talk about, say, SAP, there's no, oh, well, the Coast Guard does it. But even within the Coast Guard, there were other divisions of or agencies, sub agencies within underneath that umbrella of the agency who handle the SAP work. And that's the level of research and detail that everyone has to get to to understand their clients so they can start pursuing these opportunities. If you don't have that information, then in my opinion, you're still operating blindly. Right, because you are making uh, generic claims, which a lot of people, not anyone here, because all of you are watching my YouTube channel and you're learning and you're educating yourself, so you won't make that mistake. But your counterparts are out there making these mistakes where they're making these blanket claims that the Navy is my client, the Coast Guard is my client, the uh, National Parks is my client. Eric, I did my target market research, and man, you know, the whole Army is my client. The whole army is not your client. That's impossible that the entire army is your client because the entire army doesn't buy every single service that you offer. So uh, one of the things that every one of us has to do is get to intimately know our clients. And in order to start looking at um, simplified acquisition opportunities, we have to know who is actually giving out simplified acquisition opportunities. Now, once you have figured out, again, that's one piece of the pie. Uh, once you, and again, and that's if you're looking at targeting or marketing uh, a wide, casting a wide net. So that's, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about several different options. So this is one option is, is let's look at the agencies uh, within our uh, organizational structure and the particular codes that we want to target, who are spending dollars on their simplified acquisition. So that's one way that we can do it. But not only are we going to be just looking at them, you have to then talk to not contracting officers because that's so many people's mistake because they want to talk to the contracting officer. You have to talk to the actual end users. So who are the building occupants? Um, in our case, like you said, civil engineering. Civil engineering unit are, are the people that are designing, that are writing up the scopes that then get handed over to the contract professional. By the time it gets to that contract professional, you are too late. By that time, the simplified acquisition is gone. Okay, it's been awarded, it's down the street. You don't miss that boat sail, you don't miss that boat. Speaking of a, a recent and relevant experience share for everyone out there to know. I received a phone call from an ex-contracting official uh, last two weeks ago um, about, hey, they had a flood inside their building. They needed help with 
you know, cleaning out the flood and getting that, uh, you know, getting it cleaned up and moving some equipment, some desks, things like that. Well, how did that person know to call me? Because I have been serving uh, that person in many different capacities for a long period of time. So now they know when they have something that uh, that's small, that is, again, it's in my area of specialty of expertise, they just pick up the phone and call me. Well, how did they know to call me? Because I've served them and helping them solve problems for so long. So now before the, the actual, anything is ever written up on paper, I get the phone call and then we have to develop the scope. So um, Maria, we I think we talked about that recently, which is, hold on one second. I'm going to show this message on here. Okay, Maria and I talked about this recently where she is meeting with project engineers to help when there is a situation that occurs and we're helping them to first develop the scope requirements. Everyone out here, listen, how do you think that the government gets their government estimates? They have to talk to people in the industry, professionals like yourselves, okay, in order to be able to get factual, like uh, a measurement of what something should cost. So who are the people that they're talking to within the industry to be able to get uh, pricing on the services that you and I sell and offer? Who are those industry people that they're talking to in order to get pricing and figures and numbers? And I can tell you in my particular case, in my particular situation, if you're in my backyard, they're talking to people like me. Now, again, there is so much opportunity. There's so much contracts. There's so much uh, potential out there that, you know, they could be talking to me. They could be talking to Justin. They could be talking to Brian. They could be talking to Sharon. They could be talking to Melissa. They could be talking to all of us out there because there's so many agencies. There's so many sub agencies of agencies that there's no, none of us, even all of the people on my email list, all 7,000 of us could not possibly serve the, the the vast number of contracts and opportunities that exist. So don't feel as though like, uh, like okay, well, I've got the inside secret or I've got the inside sauce. No, um, we just continue to talk to people. And when we're meeting with them, we ask them, what problems can we solve? I'll tell you a funny story about my podcast guest today, Caesar. He said to me, when he used to go to conferences, and you have these matchmaking sessions uh, that were five minutes. I don't know if any of you have ever been inside of a conference, but a five minute matchmaking session. So you go in and you have these one-on-one -on -one sessions with all these different agencies for like five minutes. And today they're probably doing the same thing that, but it's doing it virtually. So what he would do is he would get in the booth and he would ask the government person, um, he says, what is it something that that person that just came before me did that you didn't like? So that I can avoid doing that. And they would sit down, and they would laugh about it, and then he would spend his five minutes talking about that, not about his company or business. And you're thinking to yourself, wow, that's counterintuitive. But really, it's intuitive because the idea is if they're gonna be meeting with 50, 75, 100 people today, how do you become the guy or the girl that stands out? And everyone's gonna come in there and say, I'm 8A certified, I'm Hope Zone certified. You know, I'm minority owned. I, I have a trucking company. I own five trucks. Uh, I do cybersecurity. I do IT. Everyone's going to say that. And at the end of the day, who is going to be the person that they remember, right? The one guy that comes and sits in front of them and say, hey, what did the guy before me say that you didn't like? That's the guy or the girl that they're going to remember. Um, people forget that people like to do business with folks they like, know, and trust. We all remember that. Well, how do you start building that relationship in a two-minute or a 90-second or a four-minute type of interview, right? It's not trying to spill off every single thing that your company does. We do uh, cybersecurity, IT, network infrastructure. We've done cyber we've done 500, we, don't, we did, um, we did $150,000 last year. We did $200,000 last year. The people are out of, look, they are so out of breath and taken back. Like, okay, the next guy sits down. Uh, we do cybersecurity. We do IT. We do, we do infrastructure. We do network capability. Uh, we got 55. The next guy comes and sits at the table. Same thing. We do cybersecurity. We do 50. We do and at, at some point, right, um, you sound like the last 10 people that sat there and said the same thing, right? 
you know, your 8A, your hub zone, you are blah, blah, blah. You do cybersecurity. I know, I know. Uh, you've done this, you've done that. And it, it's great, but how do you stand out? How do you get the person? Um, and this goes back to, and, and I will say, that's why I like IG versus YouTube, because I could always pull in Maria to be able to like chime in and give her experience share to, to kind of like, you know, what they say when you're in, in the choir, they, they, they preach, brother. So Maria could come in and just kind of like piggyback off of this because uh, a real life example is when Maria went with her client to visit the NASA Kennedy Space Center, the client went into someone and gave uh, like his capability stuff. And then Maria went in and said, gave the same capabilities pitch. But guess who left out there with a car and a callback and an email and a follow up it was Maria because of what she said and how she said it. So there is a huge uh, difference and a distinction between how you come across. Uh, we all uh, are going to have that five minute window to sit in front of somebody, right, to get a chance to pitch your company, to pitch your idea. And if you're in a conference or event where there's 50 people in there, right, saying something that is um, not conventional, right, and not like the rest of the folks out there, because truthfully, how many of you can really tell me what it is that you do in five minutes? Hell, Maria, no, I can't even talk with a podcast guest for under two hours. Like we are like, I would just, I, I promised I was going to get off today at 530 and 6.08 and him and I are still talking on the call. <laughs> and it's like, I mean, and we were, and we were still talking, like we literally, and I said 5.30 was my cutoff date and 6.08, I started at four and 6.08, we're still getting off the call. I had 11 a.m. call uh, this morning and we're running into 12.56 on my 1 p.m. podcast guest but for my 11 a.m. guest. And so it's like by the time I finish that, so how can you possibly convey to someone in a two-minute one-on-one session with an agency all there is that you can do? So, you know, the thing is, why not try something that's uh, unconventional, so to speak, and non-traditional, which is, hey, what did this other person say that you didn't like? Or what did someone say today that you did like? Right. Um, what is a question? What is a good question that people ask you? Think outside. Try to relate to the person. Right. Try to understand that person's needs. Try to understand that person's gaps. Right. Because maybe they're there because they have to be, but maybe they're there because they're looking for um, a spark somewhere. And um, just stating the the your business the name of your business alone, all of that information is already in your capability statement. Um, and telling them, all, basically reading to them the capability statement is not the maximum, the highest and best use of your, you know, your five minutes that you have in front of that person. So definitely, I kind of wanted to share that out there. Is when you're in front of someone, I, that was a technique that we learned that we used. The other thing that I want to say is, Again, drawing from our, our experiences of talking with people every day, uh, we have an opportunity today that we're working with someone on. Um, and, you know, I talk so much about being ready, right? Being ready, being ready, being ready. And uh, I say this to folks out there, um, you know, we're giving, we give people a lot of good information and people still continue to not be ready to receive it. Um, we literally took someone to the well to drink uh, in terms of a day opportunities. And because they failed to do their paperwork, um, they are now uh, not, uh, cannot receive a, a good letter in standing with the SBA in order to, to be given uh, SAP type contracts. And that's awful. And the worst part is to, um, to be able to, to blame someone else for why you're failing to comply is such a, a, a tragedy. I mean, it's just a tragedy in, in its nature because it's so easy for us out there to finger point, to blame, to look for excuses, to make exceptions uh, by using the word but, right? It's like, yeah, Eric, I know there's all these contracts out there, but, yeah, Eric, I know there's SAP out here, but so many of us, uh, when you hear yourself doing that, just stop and listen to what we talked about today and and stop using the word but 
after your sentences because it really, when I, people like me hear that, and Caesar actually said the same example of uh, you're making an excuse, you're trying to justify um, or rationalize in your head why this will not work, why, um, yeah, you believe, but, so that, so every time you make that exception, you're really closing off your mind to the possibility that these things actually do exist uh, in their form, and, and also some of the information that we're giving you uh, does work, it's tried and true by making those exceptions. So, and going back to the story, uh, this person uh, said, uh, used the excuse that it was someone else's fault why they were not compliant <laughs> with uh, submitting. And again, and I and I could be candid. It was really just submitting your finan their financial information uh, to the government. So they used the excuse of why they that the government had not responded to them in a manner in which they like deemed appropriate. But it doesn't negate the fact that you have not submitted your financial information and your financial documentation. And that to me is the story of so many small businesses out here. A lot of folks out there are operators, they're not owners, and I think that to really to make the, the this thing work that you have to start to become business owners. It's fine to be an operator uh, at the level that you're at today, but if you really want to grow and take off, you have to at some point see yourself as an owner of the business, which means that as an owner, everything falls on you, on your shoulders, and you can't make exceptions uh, for the fact of maybe, uh, you know, the guy didn't tell you. Uh, because now that you do know, what are you going to do now to correct that issue? Because now that you have been made aware that this is a problem, what are you going to do to fix it? And that, to me, is what I've seen in my podcast guests that distinguishes those successful people from those that, that just fail. And they fail at all the programs, regardless of whatever certification or designations that they receive whether it's uh, Section 3, DBE, CBE, um, if they continue to make excuses uh, and justify uh, inactivity, inaction, then they're going to get exactly that. They're going to The results are going to show, they're going to reflect in, in the behavior, and they're going to reflect in, in your wallet because really you're not going to have a, you know anything in there to be able to show. Uh, that's something that really just stands out to me because, I'm, again, I'm listening to people I'm taking in for what people are doing and what people are telling me out here. And I'm saying to myself, if you if we've gotten this far to take you here and bring you here and deliver this opportunity for you, why would you then at that point uh, make an excuse other than the fact to say that I'm going to get it done and I'm going to get the information in so that I could be compliant and be responsive? To me, that's the only thing that should come out of your mouth is that now that I know what I need to do, I'm gonna go ahead and do those things. And, and I wanna say that because, again, to me, um, all of this makes a difference. When Marie and I had an opportunity, came up to us, uh, and this, again, by the way, today, today, this morning, I received an invitation for a project from GSA, uh, that they asked me if we were willing, able to, to go after this project. They gave me a two sentence description of the project and said that they had, it was a short time frame. They had to have it awarded before, like in two weeks. And so we had to give them the numbers back in two weeks. If the government reaches out to me or, re, or you and gives you that opportunity, you can't say, well, why did they only give me two weeks to do it? Does that make sense? Uh, Stephanie in our group was given three days to hire 40 people for a janitorial contract. You can't say, well, why did, and, and Caesar pointed this out to me, right? The difference between the successful person and the person making excuses, well, how come they only gave me three days? And they want me to hire how many people? 40 people? Like, what? what? I mean, can they have started with 10 people first? Like, why didn't they say, look, you know, give me 10 people and then 10 people and then 10 people and then give me two weeks to bring up 40 people? That, that is the attitude that she could have carried into the situation, in the scenario. Well, and this guy wants me to hire 40 people. I don't have no money for that. And, and instead, she said, okay, um, look, I can go out and find the 40 people. How are we going to be able to finance it? Because we don't have the means to be able to support 40 people. And it's just a difference in, in attitude and mindset and, and how you carry yourself. 
So I want to say that to folks out there because if the government were to call you, like they called me today, and said, I have two weeks to give them a proposal that I have to turn around to get approved for this opportunity, uh, some half of you, I would say, and I just say half because it's uh, you know all the number. Half of you are going to say, "Well, why did they only give me two weeks to do this, Eric? That's not, that seems unfair." And then you know, then there's going to be half of that, half of like twenty five percent of you that's going to say, "Well, um, I can do it, but two weeks is short, uh, you know." And really, I, I didn't turn in this other piece of paper, and I and I kind of am not really registered in Sam. And, uh, yeah, I kind of, uh, I don't really have the capability statement together to send to them. Right. And then you're going to get 10% of people going to say, well, you know, I have eight of the nine things they requested. And then, you know, 5% or 2% of you are going to say, oh, you know what? I was already prepared for this. I was expecting something like this to happen because I've been diligent. I've been following the process. I got my company ready. And now have everything that they need in order to be able to receive this opportunity out there. And you want to fall in that 2 to 5% of the people. Okay. Uh, because if you were to receive, and, 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 and by the way, and that's why I like telling stories on here. Um, one girl, one truck, she had the same thing happen to her where she signed up for the female list and they called her and she could do it. and you know, no knock on her, uh, but that happens so often that we're not ready to receive the opportunity. Part of that means, yeah, maybe you can't do it all. So then, at so part of your job should be now is expanding your network because what if they do give you something that's bigger than what you can, what you're able to take on? Do you have an expanses of enough network? to tap into to be able to maximize that particular opportunity, right? Because if she had been able to capitalize on that, where would she be today? Where would her business be at today? Who knows what the story would be? She might be one of my podcast guests come next year, right? Because if she had done that one big contract for FEMA with 70 trucks and then they give her a follow-on contract and a follow-on contract, she may be already the go-to supplier vendor for FEMA and a lot of times again that's the difference in two stories today Stephanie is in a group as a success story saying how she's now has 40 people working on a janitorial contract right for the since April since April and again it's just a matter of but but what she did was when she was presented with the challenge of getting 40 people together she turned to her network and had three or four other people who had access to folks reach out and call on her behalf as well. So not only was she calling people, she had three or four other like agencies calling people to pulling it together. So, and again, it's getting 40 people in three days is a big undertaking. She was able to do it. So, and she just, one girl on truck, she just commented right there in the, in the comments, she's getting ready for the next call. So a lot of times what happens is we go out and we get registered on these lists. Like the person in the beginning said, they spoke to Cromley. Everyone should find out, and if you don't know what that is, Cromley won that big contract for trucking. Um, if you don't know, if you're in that space in an industry, so many of the other people should have spoken, reached out to Cromley. They reached out to Cromley because I posted that on my IG. I talked about it on YouTube. I put the video up there, and it's a good example of getting ready to receive the opportunity. Simplified acquisition, it, it comes fast, it comes last minute, it comes with uh, having to be ready, it comes with having to have your paperwork together. There is no time when they call you, when they email you, it's not the time to get ready. It's too late. You might as well just walk away and say, forget it, I can't do it. It's, it's not the time. In fact, hold on, let me see if I can pull this up today so I could show you because you know me I like to show people stuff I'm just I'm just that kind of way I like to show people stuff let me show all of my folks on here because that's what I do uh, bum, bum, bum. let me change this change it to 
Mm. Oh, here. Ah. All right. Either way, you can see it here. It says, good morning. We're inquiring about your interest in the following project, federal building. This consists of removing carpet and tiles. We've been notified by the SBA, your 8A vendor. Please let us know if you have any interest in submitting a proposal for the mentioned project. And that's it. That came this morning. That's what that's what the government does. Once they know you're a go-to guy, you're a go-to vendor, they send you these emails. Uh, if you start using the techniques we talked about with RFIs and social sought and start marketing to agencies, they know you're a go-to source. But you gotta, you gotta get there first. You gotta, you know, you gotta demonstrate that first. You gotta let them know you exist. Um, you have to put your name on the list. You gotta put your name in the hat. You have to talk to the park managers if, if, if that's your agency. You gotta talk to the project engineers. You gotta talk to civil engineering groups. Um, you gotta talk to the folks that are helping to shape the requirements of what they look like. Uh, another good video that I recommend to folks out there is the one where we, we sit down with Ryan and Ryan and I go over and it's a two hour video so I know it's quite, quite lengthy but Ryan and I talk about how is it that hold on how does the government have these requirements out bum, bum, bum. So another good video right here. How are acquisitions written and why is this important? So in this video, which only has 887 views, um, we go in and we talk about, right, he's the one, the user that's writing the acquisition, and we discuss how the user, right, doesn't always understand how to write the requirements um, for the government. And we also talk about in that video here how the government itself the, by the, it gets to the contracting officer, they're just taking what that user says on paper, putting it into the actual government form that says, okay, these are the way in which we're going to buy this, firm fixed price, uh, cost plus price, you know, time and materials, whatever the case may be. They're just looking at uh, how hard is it, how competitive is it, and they're assigning a way in which the government's going to reimburse or pay the contractor to procure such services. However, if you want to know um, of what the actual user is going through the mindset of the actual user, uh, that's the video to watch because that's going to tell you about what is the mindset of the actual user who's developing the requirement and how are they thinking about that those developing those requirements. Because again, and he gives ideas in there of examples of how is it that you can better help the user. Look, to me, this is all serving the same uh, role the same function, which is we want to help support the government. Everything that I do is, and and you know, when we talk about it, and again, I know we phrase it in the point of helping you, you know, everyone out here to, to generate business and to make money, but at the same time, what we're doing is we're we're really helping the government to fulfill its mission. And when you start looking at and start talking about in that light and saying. How do we help you to be able to fulfill the mission, right? Um, people are going to be more open to talking to you, more apt to wanting to share with you, um, uh, thus apprehensive and giving you information, uh, giving you tips, to sending you to the next person because they realize that you're talking the same jargon. Um, if you're only saying that uh, I'm a hub zone and I want to know how to get more contracts, I'm a 8A, I'm a women-owned business, and I want to know how to get those SAP contracts with the government. Like, tell me where those SAP things are at. You're not going to get the same type of response. You're, you know, what I say is that we go in and we look at, and, and we talk about this. Uh, some of the things that I talk about on Twitter is I look at the Government Accountability Office, where the government's falling short, where they're not doing some of their goals, where they're not meeting some of their performance measures. And we talk about those items. We talk to the government about those things. Because if there is a agency who is literally saying, we're having problems with XYZ, then wouldn't it 
wouldn't they be welcome or love to hear from a customer or person, a company that says, hey, we have the solution to X, Y, Z. Does that make sense to everyone out there? Uh, so when you're looking at, like Maria is a problem solver. This is why she gets the calls. I'm a problem solver. This is why I get the calls. If you can look at yourself as a problem solver for a respective agency, regardless, regardless of the whether it's something that falls within your NAXCO or something that falls within your area of specialty, if you if the government asks you, can you help them find if they if you say, let me ask you something. What is some what is an area where you need help at right now today? Today, not tomorrow. What is an area that you need help with today? And one of my, you know, one of my podcast guests just gave this example. And the government says, you know, one of the areas that we need help in is uh, we can't find someone to help us with moving. Right. We're really we're, we're trying to move out of this office space to another office space. And we're struggling trying to find movers. You go out and say, OK, well, maybe I can help you with that. Right. And um, they say, really? Yeah, maybe I can help you with that. And so you go off and you talk to them about how do you help them find a mover. And and that's like, that's the basics, right? You're like, oh, it can't be that simple. Um, but yeah, it actually, it can be that simple because the idea is, and I'm, gonna, I'm trying to find you something on here because Randy is really good at doing this. Randy has kind of carved out her own niche in the marketplace for doing this. And so here's an example on our channel where Randy uh, was talking to uh, folks out there and she said, hey, what are some of the areas where you're having challenges at? And on this particular video, we talked about Randy discovering that there was a plethora of contracts that were going unfulfilled because in some of these cities and smaller areas, they didn't have contractors that could do them. So there are areas in North Carolina, Indiana, Arkansas, and the government was literally just giving her a list and saying, we can't find vendors here, 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 here. All of this is SAP stuff. What does it say? SAP. So it's like they literally just opened up the book and said, hey, uh, we have a project here, here, here. And uh, fortunately, because I talked to Randy on a frequent basis, I was like, Randy, what are you doing? Like, Put this out to the GovCon group. Put this out to the people and to the world so that we can share this with people in our audience. And that's what we did. And one of our GovCon students was awarded a SAP project as a result of reaching out to Randy, Randy connecting that person with the contract official and the contracting official, only sending out the RFQs to the people that were contacted. That's it. It didn't go on beta.sam. She literally, she had a couple people on the list, which we were the ones that provided it to them. And then they, those were the only folks that got that opportunity. And then uh, Rafa, who's also a GovCon giant, she was able to be the beneficiary of one of those contracts. And in fact, I spoke with Rafa um, recently, I think it was last week, and she said she's going after another one, SAP, with the same agency. Uh, that's, you know, maybe a couple hours from there. That's like the next state over. And I know we did the same thing out in California uh, as well. So making those relationships, those connections, being a problem solver, like Maria Mar said, that's what she does. That's what I do. Uh, making yourself available. That's how you put yourself in a position to start getting those opportunities. And then now uh, what we're doing is we are curating all this stuff and we're sharing this information in our in our community. Uh, we're sharing this information with our people, and we are trying to find a, a streamlined approach to to capture all this stuff and make it available so that we can literally say, okay, uh, we have people that do blah 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 blah, and we're in all these areas and start helping the government check off some of their boxes and fulfill some of their needs. And by the way, just so everyone knows out there, this is what they call a win win win. This is a win-win for everybody. It's a win-win for the agency because they had, again, they had a problem with having someone fulfill these contracts. It's a win for the contractor who won the contract because there are people saying, I want contracts, right? So they were able to get 
something that wasn't publicly bid, so they didn't have to compete with 20 people. I think they competed with one or two people, persons, companies. Um, so it was a win for them because that means that um, they were able to get the contract at a price where they could make some money and help grow their business. And then it was a win for someone like Randy because now she's seen as a trusted resource. And then what happens when you become a trusted resource? They come back to the well and they call and they call an email and that's what's happening. So Randy has now become a trusted resource for this person, this contract spoke. And now, like I said, she's looking at opportunities all around the country for that particular contracting officer's agency for the opportunities that she's given. So it's a win-win-win for everyone involved. And I would like to see more of you out there. That's why I teach this stuff. Because if I can teach the 56 people that are watching this today to do that, imagine we could create our own list of opportunities, right? Imagine if everyone was like Randy and you had a contracting officer that sent you five to seven opportunities that were going unfulfilled that were SAP. If we were to, to take that, multiply it by the 58 people on here, we'd have 300 plus opportunities of all different scope sizes and regional areas that we could then share amongst each other. And I'm sure that within the group here, we could collectively get them all done and accomplished and allow, essentially create our own uh, way of uh, giving each other contracts and opportunities and then growing simultaneously, right? What they say, when tides rise, all ships rise with the tide. So we could basically be all growing simultaneously. And that's the objective and that's the goal of it. So, so that's why, again, people say, well, Eric, why do you give all this information? Because if I educate more folks out here, then you can then come to me with an opportunity that I can then share to the group and pass along and someone else can capitalize on that. Um, I have something else that someone reached out and did an RFI for the government, and they literally on the RFI, the government said, we can't not fulfill this request, this requirement, we need help. And they send it out to me. So I think there's a lot more of that to go around. I think that's happening a lot more often than people believe. And so, you know, those are some of the things that we talk about when it's like, how do you start to position yourself to receive these things? Uh, one is you got to be proactive. Uh, you got to be proactive. You, you have to reach out and start talking with people at the user level. Okay. If you've got to get to, if you, if you only have contract and officer, contract and specialist number, you're not calling them to talk to them about a specific contract, uh, the one that you're looking at. You're getting contact them about the user to get to the user level so that you can help with the requirements before they actually ever make it to that person's desk. Uh, once something is publicly posted, folks, and I have to say this, I want you to be smart to have been the average fifth grader. Uh, once something is publicly posted, there are certain rules about contacting the contracting folks out there. Uh, and so you've got to be really careful. And then they have to be re really careful and mindful because contracting officers are, uh, they have what's called warrants where they basically had to become certified and they're potentially liable for doing things wrong. Um, that liability, I think at the worst case, goes up to jail time and fines uh, if they're found in violation of doing something that goes against the proper protocol. And so you have to be really cautious and careful when trying to talk to them about a publicly posted opportunity. So that's a really fine line that we, you know, we really don't want to get into to crossing because you don't want to jeopardize. You, first of all, you don't want to jeopardize your 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 one and only chance to make a good impression with that agency. So if there's anything that you want to talk to them about is about something that's not publicly posted. Um, it's about something that really uh, maybe that was that went out last year or it's not out yet or just to get have them point you in the right direction of who you should be talking to uh, regarding that opportunity, right? So it's more like, hey, uh, I'm calling you, but I just want to know Right? Who should I be reaching out to that can give me more details about the challenges that you're having uh, at that building? Right, And then they may say, oh, we'll call the civil engineering base. You see how that is a less uh, invasive type of question as opposed to, hey, can you tell me about this specific contract that's on, that I just saw on beta.sam? And I'd be like, no, we can't tell you that. Like that's whatever information you see is what you get. If you have any questions, send us an R5. And you get shut down. And then you're like, well, I thought I'm supposed to be calling this. No, don't, no, that's that's not what you're supposed to do. So um, definitely just kind of be mindful of that. And I, and I want to 
you may start hearing me repeat things, and it's only because people are continuing to make these same mistakes or people are continuing to get what they call letdowns because they did something that wasn't exactly the way that we said to it. And so they became discouraged um, and they had themselves a setback and they're like, well, this thing doesn't work. And it's not true. You just, that nuance is a big one, <laughs> right? Like to you, you're like, well, you said call them. Eh. Yeah, that's true. But what you say and how you say it also makes a really big difference. And then all the timing of it, right? If it's in the middle of a contract opportunity where other people are trying to competitively bid, that's been public posted publicly, you're kind of putting their job in jeopardy. And so I would probably uh, expect nothing less than them to be nasty to you or rude to you because of well, the way that they perceive that particular situation or scenario. So just know when to do things at the right time, who to talk to about what and when and where. And specifically for simplified acquisition, you want to talk to, again, uh, the actual users who are actually going to be the beneficiaries or recipients of the contract when it actually comes out. Uh, because those are the the ones that are helping shape the requirements. Those are going to be the people that are saying, look, this is what I want. I want this, 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 and that. Okay, and I want it to look like this, and I want it to look like that, and you tell me what it's going to take to do it. They then take those requirements back to the contract folks who issue a formal solicitation that you then give a formal price on. And uh, if you're so fortunate enough, like us, to become that the go-to person, guy or girl, then you're going to be part of that whole loop and series of processes. Uh, and again, there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it because this is the way the government does business. And if you're the same person that is helping to solve that problem early on, why would they not want to use you to then issue the contract because you're the one that came up with the solution? So uh, it comes around 180 degrees um, from the time of uh, helping to, to get the phone call, to being there for them, to helping them find that moving company or helping them find uh, a contractor in another state um, or helping them find a uh a product that they, they, they can't find a contract for, you, you want to become uh, the go-to person, company for solving that particular agency's problems. Once you start to do that, then uh, definitely uh, it will become, you will become in a position to re receive much more simplified acquisition projects. So, yeah. Um, by the way, I'm gonna. I will keep this video up for a week before we take it down. So you do. Ha you will. Ha I will. I'm thinking. What I'm thinking now is I'm gonna keep these videos up um, for about a week before I take them down. Not take them down, but, but before I put them behind the members' paywall. So um, you will have access to this video before it comes down. So questions. Uh, I know we're already an hour and twenty minutes in. Um, Casey, sing the journey. You're gonna have to go back and watch the video to get that question answered. So, yeah, Maria said 24 hours. Uh, you know what? This one I may actually do take down. You're right, Maria. Actually, I'm, this one I'm going to take down because I did share some personal information on here. So I'll probably take this one down in 24 hours. So I'll put it behind the member's paywall. So, yeah, because I did share that inside email that I got this morning, I'll, I'll take this one down right away. What else? No, no, no. I changed my mind, Maria, because I, I shared that that email. So. Uh, but yeah, I I have been leaving them up for a week uh, before I make the next one to give people time to try and watch it. Just because I know everyone doesn't can't watch it in the first day. So <laughs> what else? What else? Let me see. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, Black Dog Home. Do you mentor? Yeah, we're actually working on creating coaching programs right now. We're putting that together as we speak. Um, we're definitely doing this. All right, Brian says that's a big number. We've responded about 10 RFIs since getting 8A. You know, Brian, remember this. One thing about responding to RFIs, and we talked about this before, is, okay, for me, and I showed three examples when I taught the SBA class. Uh, on my three examples, the time from when I respond to my first RFI to the time where they, I got a sole source opportunity 
Um, so one of them was 18 months, one was 13 months, and one was one month. So the, the time varies, right, between when they actually issue a contract. And what, what plays into that is funding, right? Um, the fact is whether or not they have an opportunity for you right away that fits your needs. So even though you might have responded to that particular uh, opportunity, maybe for whatever reason, they can't set that one aside or so source that one, but they're waiting for the next one that meets your capabilities that, that based on your response, they're waiting for that next project to be released. And so it's not like they forgot about you, but they just don't have anything per se um, that's on the books that they can actually give you that's related to your capabilities, if that makes sense. So definitely keep responding. Um, it took me on several of the agencies. It took me two times to respond to our RFI to get my first sole source, but it still worked. So like it doesn't matter because, uh, again, if you're in this for the long haul uh, and you plan on being in business for a while, it, it's if it takes you 13 months to do it for it to become effective, it's still a sole source. And once you've got in there and you start performing and you start exceeding expectations and delivering excellence, like I know my man Brian is going to do and all of you out here are going to do, then, right, then you become the go-to guy or girl. And now you can become like your people, Brian, AMD over there and start just like they just start giving you stuff. So it works. Uh, <laughs> Question, can you submit a proposal? Can you write the contracting officer to ask for an update if it hasn't been awarded? Uh, yeah, you can write and ask for an update if it hasn't been awarded yet, um, but that doesn't mean that they have to respond. So I think one of the things that I, 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 that I hear so often from people, again, and this is more mindset, is that people get so discouraged out there, folks. Don't get discouraged. The contracting specialist, and particularly now, they're the busiest that they have ever been. So if someone doesn't respond to you, don't go crying about it. Like, don't whine and come on and tell people, I, well, I emailed them and they ain't call me back. They, look, I have had so many people not respond, not call me back, not email me back. I take it with a grain of salt. It's part of what, how many no's does it take to get to a yes? It's okay. It's nothing to be upset about, right? Um, because we don't know what's happening on the back end of this. Uh, you know, maybe the job was protested. You don't know, right? So, uh, Keno David, what if the, the job was protested and they're not allowed to disclose any information about that contract because it was actually protested? So that's why the award was not out. Did you know that people can protest a job pre-award? So someone could go out and actually protest your bid pre-award. And it's like, wait. And I had, I've had that happen to me. I, I had a project that was protested before it was ever awarded. And it because of the protest, it took a year to make the award. So we don't know what's happening behind the scenes. We don't know what the government can and can't say to us. Um, but trust that if you did send a submit a bid, Right, you will get notified um, if it was awarded. Right, if it was publicly bid, you will be notified if or when the award takes place. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with putting them on alert that, hey, you know, do you have any timeline of when you may make this award? Uh, that might be a better question. Right, it's like, hey, uh, you know, you guys have an anticipated timeline when you're going to make this award. That's that's a fair question, but don't um, feel like as though that person is obligated to give you any information pertaining to that contract. And if they don't, like all hell should break loose. And that's kind of the mindset I'm trying to get everyone out of is that uh, these people don't owe us anything. In fact, I've had contracting folks say to people out there that you want my, me, you want, you want contracts from me. So it's your job to figure out how to get through to me. And people might be that nasty, right? And, and, and I kind of look at it from the way that it is your job to get through to them. However best you can do it. Uh, the same story going back to Randy. Well, Randy had a difficult time reaching a small business specialist. Now, this is a person whose job is to help small businesses. She could not get through to the small business specialist. Well, she had a program engineer or director or something like that 
email the small business specialist and copy Randy on it and said that they need to meet with her. And then they did. So we don't know um, what's going on, right? And what's happening. And for me, uh, what I always look at is the fact is I'm so privileged and fortunate to have such a large client like the government that there's a gazillion opportunities out there. And so if one person wants to be a douchebag, uh, then it's okay. I just move on to the next person. The next, you know, I don't have to deal with that person. Even within uh, the contracting office that I'm dealing with at the naval bases, there's freaking 10 people in the office that give out contracts. So just one contract specialist who mistreated you or didn't like you, there's still nine more people to talk to. And in most offices, that's the case. There's not one contracting specialist. There's five, there's six, there's seven. There's not one. So even if that one person don't respond, um, maybe someone else respond. Maybe someone else's name was on the list. So definitely, um, I just want to tell people out there not to be discouraged because that's what I find is that we get caught up in that trap of uh, feeling like because we tried something once or twice, it didn't work, that it doesn't work. And that's just not the case. Uh, Brian says he responded to 10 RFIs. So, you know, we got to keep pushing them out. We got to keep trying. I don't know how many RFIs I responded to before I got a sole source, but I can tell you uh, it was it took me a year for it to actually take place and start being effective. Uh, I was more effective in getting my first uh, sole source after making phone calls and doing capability briefings. Uh, that's when I got the first one, but it still took about three months. For me, and that was me, right? So and that was me. It took about three months. Um, ba, 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 ba. How do lifetime members of the course find these videos? So all of these videos will be in the course. Um, that so mixed boy. That's a very good question. Everything that we post on here, we're and that's another reason why we start putting in like topics. So then we're gonna start creating um, uh, this topic that ties to modules in the course, we're gonna start putting these videos in with the course. Uh, they're already actually in there, Mixed Boy, but we have not turned them on public yet. So uh, all of these will be in the course. Every single video that we put on here will be in the course. So that's a really good question. Nope, it's not a week, it's gonna be 24 hours. Are you gonna do a group for construction? Um. That's a good question, Liberty Quest. I like that. Maybe we should do a construction group. I'm writing that down. So construction and logistics. Okay, I like it. Thank you, good suggestion. I like it. Uh, yeah, Maria's already busy. <laughs> Maria's already, Maria already has enough stuff on her plate. We can't add any more stuff to Maria, Maria's plate. Do I have to tell them my questions beforehand? What should I ask? This is the one I lost by $2,400. <laughs> K KC Journey says, how can they protest your bid when they can't even see your bid? <laughs> I know, right? Look. People protest on the, uh, so how do they protest your bid when they can't see your bid? Um, that's interesting. How do people protest that? So sometimes, um, and let me just kind of, I'll show you. Hold on. So I'm going to show you this. This is another resource that I use that I go to. Uh, my people here at Co-Prince Law Firm, Small GovCon, and it's called a pre-award bid protest. You see that? So here on this uh, SmallGovCon.com, this this is these are this is a law firm, a Co-Prince Law Firm that they are like the go-to gurus for government contracting. So they're a great place like to pull a knowledge a knowledge base as well. Um, I love them actually. We had on our website uh, Matthew Schoonover from Co-Prince Law Firm. He's a partner at the firm. Uh, he did an episode with me. Hold on. I'll pull it up.
okay? So we did an uh, episode with Coprint, uh, Matthew Schoonover, where we talked about joint ventures and mental appraisal program. Definitely want to go back and check that out. So let's go back over here um, to their site. So uh, let me see if he talks about here. Okay, here it is. Why should a company consider following pre-work protests? So what it talks about is helping reshape the foundation procurement for you to win the award. So for example, if an agency sets a procurement aside for a small business, right, based on incomplete market research, and a large business was successful to protest the set aside designation, it could lead to reopening it up to an unrestricted basis. Ooh. Or if they release a solicitation for a piece of firefighting equipment but include an unreasonable limitation on the size for the fire suppressant, it may uh, eligible offer might be excluded from competition based on their equipment's larger tank size. So there's two examples of it, um, which is basically, yeah. So if you want to help them reshape the requirements, maybe, um, so for example, if you say, and this, and again, as you see, obviously that was by a large business who, who, who was an example of that. Uh, in my case, when they pre, when they protested um, us, what they said was, how could another company be awarded this particular contract when the RFQ, the request for a quote from the government was that it had to be a specific type of metal building, okay? And so they protested saying that um, the government had uh, essentially, it was like, what do they say? What was, I, I can't try to think of the words choice they used. Something to the fact that the government had worked with us to uh, give us inside information about their company's like building design or something to that effect. And so they were protesting that there should be no one else that could be awarded that contract other than their company who was the used as the basis for the design for that project. And it was just, it was really interesting um, because the funny thing is, is that that company that they use the base of design gave me a price to, for the, for what they would charge me to build this building. Um, and I use it as a measure, a benchmark to determine what my price should be at, where they were at. Uh, and then I just recreated my own design because in the government's realm, it says if you can offer a, a similar type of design that meets all the same standards, that that's comparable. And so we were able to win on that. And But it took a year. It, I mean, it took a year to happen. So, All right. Are all awards posted on SAM? Nope. Wolfman J, all awards are not posted on SAM. Greetings from Toronto. What's up? Oh, that's Fred. All right, Fred. See, everyone has all these different names. Hey, look, listen. First of all, just a couple of things. We are growing a lot. Um, and so, I, you know, I'm already having a hard enough time remembering your real names. And then y'all give me these YouTube names. And then I go on Instagram and you give me another Instagram name. And it's like, how can I, I can't keep up with all y'all different uh, pseudo names nicknames, you know, would your wife call you, would your baby mama call you, I can't keep up with all this stuff, look, y'all gotta tell me who I'm talking to out here, because I, otherwise I don't know, or just put your real name, that'll make it simple for me, <laughs> uh, LaVorne says, I think it's incredibly unfortunate though, if that's their job to help you, they should help you, the problem is that many of us work in a full-time job, it takes time to contact folks, uh, yeah, well, you know, I'm, the thing is, it, yeah, I mean, that's one way to look at it and say it's incredibly unfortunate. And that's, again, when I talked about early on is saying, but, so you're making an exception. Um, yeah, I agree with you. It is unfortunate. However, you know, that's the way the government works. And if you want to be in this game, if this is what you want to do, you got to kind of figure out how to do it and, and work within the system. Um, we, You know, I don't create the system. I'm not monitoring the system. I'm not responsible for making the government do their jobs. Uh, the government has whatever, I don't know, 3 million employees or 6 million employees, whatever they have. I'm sure they have a hard enough time getting everyone to do what they're supposed to do, when they're supposed to do it, how they're supposed to do it effectively. Just like if if you or I had 3 million employees to manage, we would probably have a hard time getting everyone to do their jobs as well. So if you look at it from the standpoint of the government, um, it's really, 
you know, managing a humongous organization, managing millions of people, it's kind of hard to keep everybody accountable and on track. And and the other thing is, is that we don't realize this. And I, and I look at this because I see the news and I see what people tell me in the news. It's like, okay, let's say the government was to fire all the people that did not do their jobs, right? So let's take your example and say it's unfortunate that it's their job to do, help us. What if the government went and fired everybody that was not doing their jobs right now? Then you would say, hey, look what they're trying to do. They're trying to sabotage a small business program by firing all these people uh, at the same time. That's not giving small business contracts. So it's like, what do people want the government to do? I don't want to be in that position. So I'm happy that I don't have to make that decision. But I, I just want to give people another perspective to look at things so you can turn the lens around and say, well, yeah, you're right. That's unfortunate. Or, yeah, that sucks. Or it stinks. Or it, it's whatever you want to say. But at the same time, you could also take the, the attitude and says, you know what? Screw that agency. They're, they're missing out on working with me because I'm smart. I'm competent. I'm capable. I'm going to bring them good value. And I'm going to go over here to somebody who's going to recognize my value. And then at some point, maybe come back around to them once I've done, you know, one or two, three more things, right? But at the same token, if you want, the, if the government had to go out and literally, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, to listen to this, the government already has a shortfall in finding talented people. This is a, I'm telling you, I've read the articles. The government is having a hard time keeping the best and brightest minds, the talented people. Why? Because as long as you've got Apple, who's got a $2 trillion valuation, Jeff Bezos, who's got a, a trillion dollar valuation, Microsoft with a trillion dollar valuation, they can pay the smartest people the highest wages and nobody's going to go work for the government. Well, if we continue to deplete those people, we're going to get more people that are going to do less for us. And then the only thing it's going to do is perpetuate what you're talking about or, or making a, a stink about now, which is worse people working for the government because they're the only, you know, because they would rather uh, do less work because they don't have to be as accountable in the government because you get a paycheck no matter what rather than go work at Amazon, and then the talented people who are really are the hard workers are going to go work for Amazon, because why? The starting salary is a quarter of a million dollars a year. The government won't pay me that, never will pay me that. I don't need a freaking pension if I make half a million a year. I'll make my own pension. So, just want to say that, because again, this is this is just the reality of it, folks. I mean, I can't I can't do nothing but give you the information. Like, like my man Steven said, I can't take the camel, right, and make you guys drink. I'm just giving you, I'm just giving information. You know, I try to get people out of what I call the fishbowl method, which is uh, get registered, get certified, big contracts, hope and pray, right? Get registered, get certified, big contracts, hope and pray. So that's the fishbowl, what we call fishbowl method. And my, me and my man Caesar were like, we're literally, we're, we took the glass and we're tapping on it going, hey, we see you guys. Hey, hey, we see you inside that fishbowl. There's a whole ocean over here, right? While you're swimming around this fishbowl, there's an entire ocean out here of opportunities, but you're so consumed about what's happening right in this little fishbowl. And so I'm trying to take everyone out here who's following me, who's listening to me, and pulling you out of the fishbowl and saying there's a vast ocean, ocean of stuff happening, going on, and you're only focused on within your fishbowl. So I hope that helps. Uh, I know I was a little bit over the top with that example, but that's just the kind of way I am. And I'm sorry. It just it's for me. It's like, uh, what do you want me to do about it? I can't do nothing about this stuff. I'm just telling you. I'm setting. I don't want to set you up for failure and tell you everyone's gonna love you and be so nice to you and be you're such a great person and I want to help everybody. No, that's not gonna happen. Some people are gonna not call you back and not answer your phone call and not want to do business with you and not care about you and not give two stinks about your a day, your woman on, your hub zone, your white black. You woman, you you know, gay, lesbian, trans, they're not going to care. And and they might even hate you for that stuff or dislike you, but that's part of it. And that's okay because we're dealing with humans and human nature and people. And it's okay because where that person doesn't like you or doesn't want to do business with you, someone else is going to love you and gravitate towards you and want to pull you in and want to give you all the nuggets and all the tools. And so your job is to move on past that negative person and move towards that person, the closer you get towards that person with a positive vibe, the faster way you get away from that negative person that's toxic and pulling you down, the closer you're getting towards the person that's going to uplift you 
and give you all the tools that you need to be successful. And that's the one, that's the person I want you guys to go out and seek and find and look for. Um, speaking of capability briefings, is it just a more detailed discussion of capability statement? Uh, yep, that's similar out as a capability briefing. Sassy girl, Eric, thanks for being honest, transparent. Looks, it took Eric about a year. Keep going. Yep. Videos are in the course. Um, I see a lot of expired contracts, but I don't see a lot of awards posted in Sam. Sam is not the place to go to look for this stuff. I, 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 I've never told anyone to go to look, go to Sam and look for uh, those particular type of opportunities. Uh, awards are posted on FPDS and USA Spending. Um, Sam, yes, they are migrating that to Sam, but for now, awards, if you are looking for awards, go to FPDS and USA Spending, okay? Uh, that's where the are required to put awards at. Sam is where the government's required to put, as the government point of entry, GPE, that's where the government is required to put contracts over $25,000. That's what beta.sam is for. Okay. By the way, let me distinguish that beta.sam versus Sam. Um, let's see. Can you also talk about the GWCM award tool? Um, I don't know what that is. Uh, I just received an email regard to what questions I have in regards to my debriefing. Sophia Harris says, I use my government name on every profile. Thank you, Sophia Harris. I will remember you because you use your government name. So I know who you are, Sophia Harris. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Oh, Karen. Okay, all right, Karen. Okay, see? Now y'all tell me who y'all are. Now I can, like, you know, connect some names and some dots. Uh, Karen follows me on IG. Good stuff. One girl, one fuck. People want to reach out to you. Sounds like we need that that uh, Facebook group started off. We already talked about where the awards are posted. Um, yep, we've got videos on that. Can you be a jack of all with the government as in being construction moving IT? Uh, yeah, you could be the jack of all with the government, but you have to become uh, a proficient in one area and then move to the next area. So absolutely, I believe you could be a jack of all trades for the government. The problem is uh, you cannot be the jack of all trades in the beginning when you're a one person company. Does that make sense? So a lot of people want to say, no, 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 I want to go to government and say, I do everything. Um, me and my one person company, we do, what did you just say? Construction, IT, moving, um, but you've got one employee. When we have a company who we just on our podcast last week who does moving and logistic services for the government, she's got hundreds of employees and she, yet she can't do IT and construction. And she's got hundreds of employees and a multi-million dollar net worth, but she can't do those things. So I'm not sure how one person can do all these things that a company that's got hundreds of employees and millions of dollars in, in the bank and capital can actually not do it. So it just kind of makes you look really silly when you go to government and says you can do all these things. Um, when that's just really not the truth. Now, if you go to government and says that, hey, you know, we're looking to solve a problem and you can help find people that can do these things, that makes a big difference. But to say that your company is qualified, capable, uh, you have all the capacity to do it, I can tell you don't because right now I can tell you this. Uh, if you're doing construction, you don't have bonding. Because I like if you tell me you do all three of those things, tell me what your bonding capacity, how much you have single limit, aggregate limit. Tell me those bonding capacity. If you're in IT, do you have a TS? Do you have a facilities clearance if you're in IT? And what was the other area that you want to do? Oh, moving. Okay, so tell me uh, how many FTEs that you have. And tell me, give me a list of all of your actual equipment that you're going to have, how many trucks that you have, and how many movers that you have available. And so once I ask you those three questions, then you're going to look really silly because you're not going to be able to answer them and show me that you're actually qualified and capable. And that's what we talked about at the very beginning of this. Of In terms of SAP, you have to be ready to receive these contracts. So again, um, that just when you look at it and we talk about what do you need to do to get ready, Go and look at where what the contracts uh, look like that you're trying to go after, and you'll see for yourself that you're not qualified, capable, ready to handle three different specialty areas. So I uh, definitely want to share that with people out there um, because, again, a lot of people think that I'm just going to go out there and just cast a wide net, and whatever they throw in it, I'm going to grab. It's just not the way it works. These people are professionals. They're experts. Even if they're lazy, that doesn't mean they don't know their job. That doesn't mean they're not, they don't have a whole slew 
of database and past history and information to draw from to be able to 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 figure out whether or not the person's a charlatan, um, if they're a cheat, if they actually can do these kind of things. They have a whole host of information and databases to be able to pick through, um, you know, the people who are actually capable and competent versus the ones who just talk a good game. So, and and the first thing they do is by asking to do a write up. That's the first thing I can tell you right now. I could send you three uh, RFI requests that you couldn't submit to because you're not, you don't have what it takes to do it. So if I can do that and I'm just a YouTuber, imagine what the government could do. They'll tell you apart. Listen, guys, we're approaching the two-hour mark. This has been great. Got to go. Um, it looks like I answered mostly everyone's questions out here. Uh, can you give us an example of what kind of behavior or pursuit opportunities would be considered as being in a fishbowl type of situation? I'm going to do that for Kendall David because uh, she did say that. So let me pull up my fishbowl example. Uh, I already stated it, but I do have a visual to show you. So I will be happy to show you that visual. Bum, bum, bum. I will be more than happy to show you my fishbowl example. I'm gonna go back here. Where is it at? Where are you at? Where are you at? Where are you at? There you go. So here it is. Um, so you start off with government market, you get registered, and then you go, and again, when I created this, it was FBO at the time, Fed, Bid, and Nico. So you go in, you look at beta.sam, um, you go on Unison Marketplace and Nico, you look at RFQs, you bid, you hope and pray, and then you just kind of do that cycle, right? Um, until eventually you just get burned out. And so that's what I call the fishbowl method, is that most people go off and they do this cycle, not ever doing any market research, not ever identifying a customer, not ever identifying uh, a need, a gap, uh, not ever actually looking at uh, what opportunities exist, uh, what things can they actually uh, provide and support the government, where can they actually deliver real value, help with mission needs, things like that. Um, and so this is what I call the fishbowl method. But I think now that you've said it, I'm going to actually create a visual fishbowl with this in it. I'm going to have my marketing team work on that so that we can... <laughs> we can actually show you a visual image of a fishbowl. But yeah, this is what I call the fishbowl method, which is you get government, you get registered, and then you just keep bidding contracts, hoping and praying for something to come out. And then eventually you just get burned out. And that's what happens to so many people. And then you go off and you tell your friends that it doesn't work and that you tried it and you bid 20 projects and you haven't gotten any. And you're wondering um, if this government thing is for you and how can you keep sustaining this and building a lifelong business. And this is none of the stuff that we teach or none of the stuff that I talk about. It's, it it's absolutely goes against every grain um, in what we what we do here at GovCon Giants and at GovConEDU.com, which, by the way, is our new website. It's called GovConEDU.com. So um, that's the fishbowl method in a nutshell out there. Um, so, all right, guys. Hey, look, it looks like uh, we uh, pretty much answered everything. So... We will talk next time. Uh, if, if anybody needs any further assistance, feel free to reach out to Maria or myself. Also, uh, we will be Instagram Live on Wednesday at 8 p.m. Thanks, you guys.